So we'll be taking a deeper look at the cast, the blending, and the art of maturation, um, and how those you can create layers of flavors that you can use in your cocktail creation uh, by using and understanding more deeply the liquids uh, that you're using. And so this is such a complex uh, rum and that we want to share all the artistry that goes into it by our master blender. And the cask itself, when we really break down to it, is so crucial to developing so much more about the character of this. So not just the char, um, the age, the type of cask, there's temperature, there's a spirit type that we're putting in here, rum, the location of these, and for us, the Solera system all contribute to that final product. Um, so we will explore the impact of that wood interaction today, and we are going to uh, see how that the chemical compounds and, and delve really deep. It's gonna get a little geeky, but it's gonna be awesome. So hope you uh, come along the journey with us. All right. So we are going to move to our next. So the house above the clouds, uh, just to int introduce at this point, this is where um, Zacapa, it's our little secret. It's our beautiful place. It's 2,300 meters above sea level, which really makes our rum so unique. We have this advantage of having this altitude in this, in this gorgeous place in Quetzaltenango, where we can take advantage of the beautiful microclimates of Guatemala and use that in our production to make a rum that is extremely unique. So we will talk through a bit of, of what happens here, how Lorena uses the Solera system. I mean, if you woke up every morning and this was your view from your office, you would be inspired to make the greatest spirits in the world as well. Um, so uh, she uses several different cast styles and we're gonna delve deeper into that. Um, but first we wanna take you through a little bit of why uh, wood is so important, how wood has been used in the past in many spirits and how we then adapt that to our rum production. So uh, we've got a couple of extra contrib contributors to this amazing program. We've obviously met our fantastic Lauren Moat. Lauren is our global cocktailian, along with Mark Moriarty, our global gastronomer, and they have really been paramount in pulling together all of the content. Get enough praise, I don't think, so I'd like to give Lauren a round of applause while she's in here. <laughs> of course, to have Lorena Vasquez herself contributing to this content is incredible. She's the master of the for the last 35 years, and the paramount voice on everything that they do there. For anyone that doesn't know Dave Broom, he likes to say in his own bio, which is very short, he's a Glaswegian that likes to get paid for drinking and then writing about it. Uh, once again, a very humble man, but of course, Dave has written uh, multiple award-winning spirit books. In particular, his 2003 book on rum has been a, a massive influence on my life and a lot of bartenders. Um, of course, we've got fantastic Lynette, who doesn't need any more introductions. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some casks. So before we talk about casks, we need to understand about coopering. And some people know about cooperings, a lot of people don't. Now, coopering is this art form that gets passed down from generation to generation. It's a very highly skilled um, craft. I've got an incredible um, sense of work ethic. It's quite labor intensive, quite intense, uh, and uh, most coopers around the world will get paid on a per barrel basis. So it, there's a lot of incentive to work hard, to work fast. So these coopers are in charge of assembling these barrels, breaking them down and, and, and putting them together. And there's a couple of things that they tend to look for when it comes to cast maturation. Starting um, as early as the tree. Of course, all, most, all of our barrels come from oak. And when it comes to looking at oak trees, there's a couple of things they look for. They look for um, the age of the tree, the older, the better, the slower the growth, the much tighter the grain you're going to get. And so it's going to be a lot more watertight uh, when it comes to maturing spirits. And of course, little simple things. You want a tree which is nice and straight, so you can get some uh, good quality casks with no knots in it, because knots are going to form properly down the, the, the road when you're actually uh, producing these barrels. So from one oak tree, you're looking to get roughly about four casks worth of barrel staves. These, cut, these uh, oak trees, once they're felled, they're split up into, in, into four, and then they're quarter cut, which is a really important point we're going to get to in a minute. That quarter cut is then broken down into the final stave form. So when you're looking at the stave in this final diagram over here, you can see horizontally all of the growth rings. But what you can't see are these uh, tiny thread-like structures which actually um, transfer all of the sap, the water, and the nutrients from the heart of the oak tree to the outside of the oak tree. And 
the reason we need to consider this carefully is because if you were to assemble them in the wrong way, you're going to get a, a, a cask that can contain no liquid whatsoever. So um, my arm is a, a stave of a barrel. You want these structures to be running horizontally, but you can imagine just one slight deviation running from inside to out, all the liquid is just going to pour straight out. So just some interesting things to consider when it comes to building the cask itself. Another thing to consider is the seasoning. Now, the seasoning of a cask is about preparing it for... Uh, the seasoning of the cask is about preparing it for building it into a barrel. Now, these staves, they need to be uh, dried to around about 12% water content in the oak, and there is a, a fast way and a slow way. So mass-produced barrels will put this in a kiln. It keeps it at an ambient temperature for about one month. But there are some schools of thought that feel like th this uh, process produces some off notes, some uh, undesirables. And so the more traditional way is a two-year process of air drying and leaving it out to do this, to the whole process naturally. And then, of course, it comes to actually assembling them together. Traditionally, the uh, coopers would assemble them over a fire and, uh, and, and toast them. But what that will do, it also helps the wood a bit more pliable to be bent into shape. Um, and Lynette's going to talk about why toasting is important when it comes as a kappa. That, that, that piece of, thank you. <laughs> I was doing my best to project. Um, but that, that note and aroma that you associate with burning wood is predominantly the linion. And this includes, like I said, vanilla that's naturally present in oak um, that are increased by the heat. Um, and so this is just warming it and toasting it before you even get to a point of burning it, which is going to give something else different. Um, so char level is when we get to that point of actually letting that uh, break down a little bit. However, um, you also get for furl. For furl gives that bready, um, for dried fruit, almond kind of note um, that you get. Um, almost if you smell almond extract, you kind of get that, that idea of what for furl is. Um, and then uh, furin is, also gives toffee and nut nut aromas. Um, Eugenol uh, adds clove-like spiciness that you actually really always associate with spirits that are aged in wood. So you get those nice baking spices and all those notes, um, as well as creosol, which contributes the spicy leathery aroma. So it's, it's, it's these, once you kind of understand those contexts, when you now taste spirits of an aged in wood, you can start identifying those pieces. Um, and in addition, the tannins are released. So that is also a product of aging in wood. And that contributes that astringency, that grip, everything you want, and qualities, um, that contribute to the taste of the spirit. And then, where's my clicker? And sorry. Oh, guys, I'm like, yeah. thank you. All right, so this is our oak composition, just so you can kind of see a little bit more of, of how much of each of those items um, are, come out through the burning and the toasting of the wood. Um, so the, there's another option, as we said, going deeper, which is actually burning, and that's the char. Um, at Zacapa, we actually use a very heavy char. We're using a char number four, which is also called the alligator char that you'll see, um, you know, in whiskey, you'll see the, the varying from one to four of how much of that char you want to get. Um, our barrels, since they're coming from American whiskey distilleries, we are taking those, they get scraped, and then they get recharred to our point. So we are using this process of, our cooperage actually is very much a rehabilitation location for taking these casks and rebuilding them for our use. Um, and so so we pull them into, as we said earlier, they get steamed, they get put in some fire, let that all bend, and each, every time we add more fire to it in different ways, levels, we are getting more out of our casks. Thank you. So Annette touched on what we do to our oak to, to really generate more flavor. But let's look a little bit more um, at the technical science that's inside the oak to, to break it up. So as we mentioned earlier, you've got three main elements cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Now, it gets pretty, pretty kind of uh, geeky here, but <laughs> really loosely, cellulose offers structure, 
Hemicellulose is made up of complex po um, polysaccharides, which is a form of sugar. That, that's the, uh, the compound that's going to start caramelizing and start developing flavors. And lignin, simply put, is, is the glue that holds it all together. There, are a, is, there is a small percentage of other complex um, compounds in there that are going to contribute flavor, but not really offer much to the structure. And of course, not all oak is equal. Uh, not all oak is the same. Oak is under the genus of oak. There's around 600 different species that grow around the world. Some of them are hugely niche, like, uh, like Mizunura casks in Japan. Others are used the world wide. So when it comes to the majority of aged uh, cask matured spirits, American oak is where we go to. American oak is uh, known by its Latin name, Kirkus alba. American oak is producing uh, very high amounts of um, uh, uh, vanillin compounds, producing things like uh, vanilla, coconut, uh, toasted almonds and whatnot. Now, most, uh, most American oak is very, very low in tannins. So you just imagine American whiskey, it's very sweet, it's buttery, it's creamy. That's what American oak is bringing to the table. Next up, you've got European oak. Now, European oak, we associate with all of the products that, it, that, that are typically matured in it. Now, European oak goes by the a couple of Latin names, and there's a little bit of confusion because there's a, actually a few different varieties, but the two um, dominant types are Kirkus sessiflora and uh, Kirkus robur. Now, these are, have got much larger pores in terms of a, a, an, an actual plant, and those pores pump in a hell of a lot more tannin into your product, and so you get notes of dried fig and raisin and prune, all these classic um, flavors that you associate with all of the sherries of the world, uh, with a French red wine, uh, Armagnac and Cognac. And then of course you've got the products that actually go into those casks. Okay, so um, in addition to those types of oak, what we're gonna get from each one of those, as we said, uh, Ranza Kappa, our uh, raw distillate, goes from our um, distillery straight up into the mountains where we have our cooperage. And we initially go straight into the used American whiskey casks. So they've been brought to us, repaired, and that liquid goes in. And that initial um, seasoning for that three years that we have the, the rum in there is that we're gonna get all the flavors of vanilla, pineapple, banana, green wood, um, and orange zest. Some of those citrusy notes. That comes just from putting the rum in there and that's gonna give it this nice pale color when it comes out. Um, when we move next into our charred barrel, like I said, char number four, what we're adding is getting those notes of almond and toasted uh, vanilla and coffee and all those aromas that we do when we're getting from charring that oak into that deeper, um, so cacao, cinnamon, baking spices, all of those things, nutmeg, coconut. That's what we want to get from that rechar. Um, and then when we use the European oak casks, um, one, we use our sherry and oloroso, two different types, so which is really important. Oloroso sherry casks are going to give you that dried fruit. Um, some of those, when you have that really beautiful like apricots and this nicer, uh, all those kind of just really balances out some of the sweeter points that we just added. So you're always doing a counterbalance. And then for um, Zacaba XO, we actually then also go into cognac barrels, uh, French oak, and that's also gonna add a different flavor. So we're gonna add something that's spicy. We're gonna get to you know a lot of those drier uh, styles. So there's an art form in, in why the casks are used to bring all those different flavors and to bring those out from the rum. Um, so when you think about that, also the Pedro Jimenez adds like prune and rich, deep, round, dark fruit flavors. So this is, this is that whole palette, and when you taste Zacapa, you feel those every time you taste it. So every time we use a cask, we refill it um, until they're exhausted and we can no longer prepare them, and then they get retired to the little cask heaven. Um, so <laughs> uh, but now we've, we've learned about those flavors. I think, I mean, I'm a little thirsty. I'd like to taste the uh, <laughs> rum soon, but uh, we're gonna pass this out. We're gonna go through just a little bit of a chart here that has a lot more of what we're talking about from a technical term. Thank so um, we have vanillin, of course, which gives you the vanilla and aroma for furl, as we discussed, which gives you the almonds, that bready f dried fruit, um, the hydromex, the wow, hydromethyl for furl. Uh, gives you the caramel note. Uh, Syringohyde uh, gives you chocolate and tonka bean. Um, Cinepaldehyde 
it gives, and, and conifer aldehyde give you uh, the aldehydes and those sweet fruit notes. Um, tannins give you that astringency, that wood, that leather and spice. Lactones give you coffee and toffee. Eugenol, as we said, gives you cloves and some of those baking spices. Uh, furin gives you toffee and nut, and creosol gives you leather, um, spicy leather. So, a lot going on. <laughs> a lot going on in there. Um, and I think really taking from uh, what Jack said earlier about that buttery note that's coming from the cellulose, um, our global gastronomer, Mark Moriarty, Moriarty, really goes to those caramel notes in Zacapa, and he noted that those really go well with butter, so spiced butters, things like that. Um, is a natural pairing for him. And he looks at the different ways to pair uh, Zacapa with things like brioche, where those butter notes come out. I mean, who doesn't love a hot buttered rum? It's a beautiful combination. So I think what we can do is look through how the kitchen is using it, how Mark is, is thinking about pairing it, and then take the, that information and use it within our cocktails um, as a good example of marrying that um, food and, and beverage experience as well. All right. So. Now it's time to talk about maturation itself. We've talked about the oak, the flavors it can um, give to, to your spirit, but how does it actually get in there? And this is something that kind of demystifies that art versus science. So there's three main uh, things happening inside that cast during maturation. The first stage is subtractive, the second stage is additive, and then you've got this interactive thing, which is a, a little bit more hard to explain, but hopefully I've got some analogies. So, the first part, I say first, second, and third, this is all happening simultaneously, but I said it's ordered in that way because you're seeing the results of one a lot quicker. So subtractive maturation is essentially filtration. When a spirit goes into a cask, it's quite young, it's quite angry, it's quite vibrant, uh, and so it needs to be tamed a little bit. And the toasting process earlier in the, um, in the cask production creates this fantastic carbonic layer this layer of charcoal on the inside of the cask, which acts as like a, a charcoal filter or a Brita filter. Very, very simple. Now, during maturation, as the temperature warms up throughout the day, uh, and as it cools down in the evening, the cask is breathing. Liquid is being drawn into the pores of the oak, and pushed back out, and so on and so forth. And this fantastic action is passing that liquid over that ch uh, carbonic charcoal layer, and it's stripping off any kind of loose sulfuric compounds and mellowing it out. And it works a very similar way, the same way as uh, Tennessee whiskey does with their ma maple charcoal filtration. Does that make sense? Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the second part of it is additive maturation. And this is essentially taking all those fantastic complex uh, flavor compounds that Lynette was just talking about and pop putting them into the liquid. This doesn't happen immediately, but it happens over time. And the analogy I like to use is just like a tea bag and brewing tea. Uh, you know, the first use of a tea bag, you're going to get an intense amount of color and flavor. Of course, the second use, because we're all sustainable and maybe at one point students, uh, but the second use of that tea bag, it's going to be a lot softer, uh, a lot more delicate. But of course, the temperature of that water, the, the ambient temperature, is going to affect how much flavor is draw, drawn in. And then that's going to touch on that when it, we talk about altitude and, 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 and where it's based. And of course, we've got interactive maturation. This one is harder to explain, but this is more about the alchemy, the whimsical uh, chemistry that's happening inside those casks. As all, those, um, as all of those compounds in the oak slowly leach into the spirit, you're having this lovely marriage of, of flavors from the distillery character versus the oak character. And it's this kind of blurring of the lines that happens in the interactive maturation stage, if that makes sense. Air. So this is it was one of the most important yet often forgotten parts of the conversation. Um, and it's also one that's most, really most important to uh, Zacapa and its uniqueness. Um, so the spirit, as we said earlier, it moves in and out of the oak. It's this beautiful conversation between the, the spirit that's in the barrel and the, and the oak. And that's highly affected by air pressure, which can be associated with altitude as well. And also the ambient temperature. So all of these things come together. Um, as that happens, um, you know, air is helping to um, 
enter the cask and it's helping to give that, that room. So it gives that idea of when you see pressure. Air is crucial to having the, that conversation happen between the wood because without it, there's no movement, there's no direction. It's kind of like the conduit. Um, and then you know that there's evaporating that happens over time as we're aging, the angel share. So that can be very different depending on where you are, that rate of, um, of evaporation um, is in Scotland, the cask loose about 2%. Um, in a volume each year in the Caribbean, that goes up to 8%. Again, when you're looking at the temperature, uh, Scotland has a pretty moderate temperature, uh, so you're not losing so much. Uh, in the Caribbean, it's intense and hot, so those pores of the wood are expanding, kind of when uh, the heat, summer changes and your doors get stuck. It's that same idea. The wood is expanding at that time. Um, and then in subtropical regions, you lose up to as much as 14%. So when you're looking at you know, not only from a perspective of someone who's creating spirits, there's a lot of factors that affect your production and you're calculating for all of those things all at once. Um, so that's a very important factor to keep. Um, well, we are extremely fortunate in Guatemala because Guatemala not only has um, a bunch of different microclimates, which we can take advantage of. So we're down where our sugarcane fields are and the, that border the Pacific Ocean. We get that beautiful humidity, that heat. We can grow our sugarcane. That's very advantageous. And then we just take it right over to our distillery where we process that and, and get it fermented so we can then transport it quite a few hours away up into the mountains, which is very high when you see that kind of topography, it goes up to 2,300 meters. So from sea level to 2,300 meters is quite an impact on that, on that product and that's why we bring it up there because that's where we can age it and give Lorena the time. If we kept aging down um, in Tallulah where our fields are, she wouldn't have all that time to craft it and create it. So that's what we're doing is, is adding that, that time. So as you see that, that altitude is very sharp incline. So, as we, we look at that, this idea of how we are now using our environment um, to help us grow and to make the brand uh, into this elegant spirit. So I think what happens when you see that kind of fast interaction, often it's a, you're, you know, you're aggressively taking all those flavors from the wood, whereas now we can, we can take them little by little and, and have that be a little more elegant in our execution of it. So this is probably the, the funnest chart to kind of explain to a, a room full of geeky bartenders, but um, I'm going to do my very best here. So essentially along the bottom, uh, this chart explains everything that we've just been talking about. Um, this is all about how we get flavor into our, into our liquid. So along the bottom there, it's time. And there's no specific metrics on there because, you know, age is just, age is a number people love to talk about and let's get, and get thrown around. But, um, as Dave Broom likes to say, uh, time is a number, maturity is a character. And so it, it's really not that important uh, and it's very um, geographically dependent. So you've got time along the bottom and flavor along the top. So if you start off by looking at the purple line at the very top, that's distillery character. That's the flavor of the new make spirit as it comes off the still. That's going to be affected by um, the terroir, the, the unique strains of, um, of cane that, that Zacapa uses, uh, the shape of the stills, the fermentation times, that's what that is. And it's very consistent along the whole time. The rest of it is all about balancing and working against that. So first of all, we're seeing the red line. That's that subtractive aging we're talking about earlier. That's that charcoal layer. This is, the red line represents immaturity. And you can see that it falls down. All the sulfuric compounds are getting stripped out. It's getting cleaned up. It's getting made more mellow over time. And then, of course, the fun one, which is what we're talking about today, which is cask influence. This is uh, the, the cask influence increasing over time. And you can see that there's a, a little window, two dotted lines that's kind of encapsulating everything. That's the region that you want to bottle at, and that's where you're going to get your variation. Anywhere past that, you're going to lose the distillery character because the oak's going to overpower it. And this is truly where the art of blending from Lorena really comes into play. And a good example uh, uh, to use in your bars is when you um, barrel age a cocktail. So you start with that cocktail and you're using that barrel to tone down and to integrate some of the flavors. But if you've ever accidentally left it too long and then you go through and you're like, oh man, it's so dry and, and, and you can feel that the tannins have just taken over. So there's that delicate balance between those things and when you apply that to cocktails as well, um, you'll see how those come into play. 
I think we're on the next. Uh, so the Solera system. So this is one of the most complex um, aging systems uh, for and blending systems. And we at Zacapa take this from our Spanish uh, ancestry. So th what's been great about this, this method's been used in uh, San Luca de Barrameda in Jerez, and they use this in a very uh, strict style. And the, the idea is to basically have a consistency by always adding a little bit of each barrel or our criaderas into the next one. So the idea is you always have this flow, you're always mixing and blending um, the wines. So we use a modified Solera system here because it's a little bit different we, we, where we're starting from. So we have our older lots of rum, which we keep in storage up in the aging facility to use for this blending process. Um, when the, uh, the, a, the new make spirit comes up um, into the the distill up to into the aging facility. We put it directly into those use American barrels. That sits for three years, and this is our first moment. As as Jack was saying earlier, we're, we're toning down the flavors. You know, we just made this new make spirit from uh, sugarcane honey, so there's a lot of beautiful grassy notes, and we want to start marrying those flavors bring down the proof, all of those things, and start taking some of the flavors from the whiskey barrels as they came in. Once we've done that for three years, it goes into our intermediate vats, and that's where Lorena starts pulling her spirits. And what's really important about this is that every batch, you know, rum and agri, you know, this is all a very much a agricultural product. So when, you ta when she tastes the rums, they're all gonna have different characters. And at this point, she's tasting and seeing what characters the new make spirit has developed after those three years. And then she's deciding what to pull from the older lots to put into that barrel to help it start becoming Zacapa 23 and the profile that she wants. So it's a really uh, a, a tailored experience as she's creating that. So we go into that intermediate vat and then we, we bring the older lots in and then we go into those charred barrels. So the char charred American oak is starting to add more color, the sweetness, those aromas that we want to have in the rum. And that's a really important part of that. And that stays for a minimum of one year. Uh, then we can move it in as she tastes through those, uh, those different products. We move it into the intermediate blend and again, bring all those older rums in to balance the flavors and aromas. Uh, and then we take that and put it in the sherry barrels for a minimum of one year. This is Oloroso cask at first to get those nice, beautiful, dried apricot notes, dried fruits. Um, then it's blended one more time. You get the older lots and then it goes to the PX barrels, which is again, another cask for color, sweetness, and you get all those dark, rich fruits. Um, and then obviously the water is then added and it's bottled. Uh, if it is going to become an XO, uh, you would have one more step and then it goes into the, X, uh, the cognac casks um, and then for another two years and that's how you get Sacapa XO. And this is the wonderful woman who creates all of this. Uh, she really is, if you ever get a chance to meet her, her palette and her nose is so important. Uh, and that's part of, it's her artistry that keeps that flavor component going and how we can taste Zacapa and every, every, every bottle of Zacapa she has put her stamp of approval on. And it's impressive to see that kind of artistry and, and how you can use this system to, to create a consistent product. Um, and then, so you all had your, your tasting. So when we, when we tasted it, did you find that you tasted those notes that are coming from the wood? Yeah, so what did, what did oh, yeah. Another? Yeah, sure, why not? I didn't try one. <laughs> all right, so on the nose, you're getting all that beautiful, you're getting those cherries, you're getting those vanillas, you're getting those beautiful chocolate notes. And now that we know where they come from, from the wood, it gives you a little bit of a context for where those aromas come from and those flavors. And then it changes and develops as you kind of nose from the top down on the glass. On the top note, you get some floral notes. Um, Zacapa has some really beautiful floral notes like rose um, and all these aromas that come through. So there's that complexity that you find here can give you a lot of inspiration for how to mix and how to create beautiful cocktails with this. And I always, what, I've, what I fell in love with Zacapa and what I loved about it was that Terroir and rum is so important, and Zacapa is so grounded in in the country and what it does, and and using the ag the agriculture that's there to create a beautiful product. You know the pineapple yeast that we're using um, is 
native to that area. And Monlerena isolated that. It's using all of the tools you have at hand within this country. And I think it's extremely expressive of what it comes from. And it also shows this delicate art and restraint. Um, but we've seen also that bartenders have really ad adopted Sakapa into like the, the brown spirits at university, that it's not just simply looked at as a rum, it's used as a premium brown spirit and you can play with that and that's the imagination opens up. You can go to those casks, American whiskey, and take classic American whiskey drinks or scotch whiskey drinks and you can use Zacapa in there for a different flavor. You can use cognac classic cocktails and put Zacapa in there and it works. So that all comes from this beauty that we're using those woods and we're taking some of those characters and it stands up because it has this body, this tannin, and all this complexity to it. Um, and Lauren, the lovely Lauren Moat, um, she, she made some cocktails. Yeah, she, she, her new strategy, so she created the new strategy for the cocktails this year, which I'm really excited about because they're beautiful. And we're going to let Lauren just talk a little bit about her um, inspiration for those. Yes. <laughs> I'll go back in here. Um, is everything okay? Great. <laughs> Um, recently, I was, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I think the, the serve strategy that we've always had on Zacapa is that we always had an old fashioned. It was very important that Zacapa be treated in the same way as anyone that really loved cognac, Armagnac, high-end whiskeys, because Zacapa is just as complex. And I think sometimes we misinterpret the rum category in general. There isn't one way to say this rum goes best in a daiquiri, that same rum goes best in a mojito, that same rum goes best in an old fashioned. Um, just like gin or just like any other spirit category, rum has many different parts. It is a victim and also a <laughs> celebration of terroir. So what works in some climates may not work in others. And Zacapa is in an incredible category called new rums. New rums are made from, uh, from virgin sugarcane honey or juice, which is similar to cachaça or French rum agricole. It's a very interesting thing when you take something made from the, the very basic flavor of freshly pressed and freshly ground sugar cane in its liquid form. And then what we used in the yeast from that moment onwards, we used pineapple yeast. And we've done a new make rum tasting where Zacapa in its purest form is the virgin sugar cane honey, which is really just our sugar cane juice that has been um, very... Uh, high temperature cook for 90 minutes and you get this beautiful sugarcane uh, honey which some people might look at that and say oh it's molasses like every other like every other rum which is not the case R molasses is a byproduct of sugar production which is different than what virgin sugarcane honey is so when Lorena put the five new make rums in front of myself and a couple of other people when we went to Guatemala to the distillery it was incredible that if we decide to use champagne yeast, pineapple yeast, brewer's yeast, ambient yeast in the atmosphere, or any other yeast that could be associated with fermentation, it was very interesting that the pineapple yeast was the signature flavor of Zacapa and tasted the best of all five, even if no one told you that was the pineapple yeast. It was perfect in every way. So even from the very beginning, before it even goes into barrel, Zacapa is already a supernatural product. Supernatural, man. Supernatural. <laughs> so I think, I think when reimagining the serve strategy, it's important that we don't overcomplicate things because the beauty of Zacapa is in its purest form when it comes from the bottle. Every single moment that it's gone through to get to this incredible moment that it's in your glass, we're, our job is to take one of those 500 different tasting notes that exist with Zacapa and find four really cool directions to take it where it hasn't gone before. Instead of always pairing a neat glass of Zacapa with a piece of dark chocolate. We still do that, we'll always do that. It's very important for us that people taste that, but it doesn't limit us um, in, in focusing on other directions as well. So you'll see when we go through the strategy, I won't give too much more info until um, the cocktails come out, but I don't wanna tell you anything about them really. I sort of want you to taste them um, because we developed them and then they were subject to a panel a discussion. It's not, these are the way we do it, and or, these are the cocktails we're doing, and that's it. It's more, these are the cocktails we would like to propose, and here's why. And then giving everyone from bartenders and ambassadors to um, people that work in our marketing department with Zacapa Diageo head office, we want everyone to be able to feel the same magic 
to, regardless of your interaction with drinking Zacapa rum. Well, so I think the cocktail's coming up momentarily. Yeah, Does anyone have coming. any questions to this point? So I know there's a lot of technical information um, that we presented. Uh, and so if anyone has any questions at this point, we can ask. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a big impact uh, because it's 2,300 2, meters above, mm -hmm. um, so it's aging differently. Is it like the angel shares also differently, so that's the reason why it's like so special and so unique, this, this kind of way? Because uh, when it matures differently, is, is, it, is it the same thing with the angel share? So that's the reason why you, you don't have this... Um, Okay, there comes, yes, comes we, we, yeah. so that uh, Yes, so the angel share is different um, for Zacapa. So when we talk about Scotland having an 8%, um, we, not, we have climate, and that climate up there, there's also altitude that comes into place. There's different air pressure as well. So what happens in the morning in, in Chela is that there's this beautiful cloud cover yeah. that, that exists overnight. So it almost kind of cradles the, the casks. It keeps them nice and cool. And then you have, the, by midday, the sun has burned through at that high altitude. Again, less oxygen in the air. So that's a very, that's impacting it also our angel share and the fact that we can keep them in the barrels longer because there's less angel share. Um, and also when that midday happens, that's when the barrels kind of breathe and they expand at that point. And then as again, the temperature cools at night and we get that process again, then it constricts again. So you're constantly just having this beautiful, every day this, this beautiful conversation between the wood, whereas in other climates where you have cold and then it's hot uh, and humid. So even when you look at Kentucky, they have pretty cold winters uh, and then the summer's hot and humid. So they're having that conversation that we're having daily over several periods of months. So it's a very different interaction and uh, how that works. First yeah, first cocktails here. So, tres tropicos, which means three tropicals, which is this awesome, so the three, rum, coconut, and pineapple. A marriage made in heaven. I mean, there's been pina coladas have existed, uh, Miami vices. This is a magical, a magical combination, but what's here is, is inventing it in a new way. So again, what's nice with this, you have this beautiful coconut foam, um, which you can do with agar agar or gelatin, use our culinary techniques and grab that ISI from the kitchen, and you can ISI this uh, to make this foam on top. So you get this nice creaminess on top, and then below you have this beautiful cocktail that has lime and pineapple to bring acidity and cut through. So in a lot of ways, this drink to me is like drinking a, a, a food item. I love how the, um, the creaminess of that foam mm. is really just boosting up all the, all the lovely cask influence in, in the rum. Normally when you think of like a rum sour, you know, you're, you're seeing rum, pineapple juice, lime and sugar. Normally it can be quite tart and astringent, whereas this is ridiculously creamy and, uh, and really I mean, it's like a pineapple upside down cake to me. It's so tasty. And I, and I was just going to say that this cocktail, was the design of it was not inspired by a pina colada. It was inspired by a Ramos Gin Fizz. Yeah. And, and making it, reinventing it in a way that could be really quite cool for Zacapa, but then highlighting it in a different way with coconut and whatever else. And if you don't want to use coconut milk, then you can use almond milk, use oat milk, use regular milk with... I think the, the recipe is quite versatile. If you're not a fan of pineapple juice, use mango juice. Like there's lots of different ways that we can use this as a benchmark to create new flavors. And it's like an elegant tiki cocktail, right? So and you also said one of the inspirations was uh, Trader Vic's uh, rum fizz and a royal fizz. So there's lots of different ways and context you can take this um, cocktail from. I, li I personally like uh, that it has that lightness that you get from a Ramos. So you do get that, that brightness and lightness of it. Um, but these are tried and true combinations. I mean, in, in Latin cooking, you see all of these flavors always playing together. So it makes sense that you would use this um, for cocktail creation. The next cocktail we've got coming out is Harmony Cobbler. And uh, a cobbler is something I'm pretty much obsessed with. Always had it on the menu in my bars, always will. I think it's just a really fun interpretation of a classy drink. Cobblers kind of came about with the rise of uh, the invention of a straw and having ice readily available. And so for a, a, a product like Zacapa that's really intense in flavor, it's really good to elongate that and lengthen that out with loads of ice. But of course, um, start, start thinking about wine. And wine is a really important part of Zacapa because of the European oak, the 
Dolorosk Sherry, the Pedro Jimenez Sherry. And so in this case, we've used Belsar Red Vermouth. Belsar is this fantastic Pinot Noir based vermouth from the Black Forest. We are in Germany after all. I'm sure most people in this room know it very well. But having something that's got a really strong wine base with this lovely kind of tannic quality just exemplifies everything that we do with the European oak with Zacapa. So very simply, it's equal parts of Zacapa, Belsar, Red and Lemon Juice. Then there's a little bit of simple syrup just to balance that out. Yes, please. What I also love about this cocktail build is that it also really goes into the, the trend that we see increasing of, of cocktails that are a little lower proof. So this is also a beautiful cocktail to pair with food. Um, and I think that's also becoming more and more um, prevalent in our industry as we've as restaurants have stepped up their level of cocktails um, because guests are expecting more and more from that experience now. And this is a beautiful cocktail for that. You can take this and, and Mr. Potato Head this cocktail, which is to swap out one ingredient, put one back in. You could, instead of using that vermouth, use Oloroso or Amontillado Sherry and, and turn this even more into a cocktail that you would like. So I would love the cobbler to that point because there are so many options of making this drink. Uh, and you can, instead of sugar syrup, you could use a pineapple cordial. So there's so many different ways you can take this template and make beautiful drinks um, for your programs. And then the Chela Coupe. So Chela, as I used earlier, it's uh, the nickname for Quetzaltenango. It's the Mayan name. Um, and this drink is based on the Martinez. So again, using cocktails that are classics are a great place to start when you want to innovate. So you look at classic construction and you swap out ingredients to make a, a cocktail. This is also Manhattan-esque. So again, it's a, it's a style of cocktail that you, know, so you see with, with whiskey drinks or cognac drinks. Um, so uh, we have the Zacapa, again, this beautiful, the Bath Cesar red vermouth. Um, this adds some of that Amontillado sherry, which is really great. So you're adding a little bit more of those candied fruit notes and a little drier notes to, to counter the vermouth. Um, some cherry liqueur, some maraschino there, um, again, to highlight some of those notes that we got in the wood, those cherry aromas, to bring those to the forefront. And then some orange bitters, as we said, those orange zest comes from those American oak barrels as well. So you're bringing all those flavors, and that's what's, what's great, is when you take, to Lauren's point earlier, you're creating drinks with the spirits you have, and you find what are the things are there in them, and then decide if you want to compare or you want to contrast to those flavors. Um, and so you're either highlighting, adding things to pop those flavors, or maybe you want something that complements. So, you know, if you take out the orange bitters here and you put uh, Lauren's uh, chocolate bitters in here, you're almost making a chocolate cherry note, which could be very different. Um, so there's just lots of different ways to play around with these cocktails. So take these as our strategy and where we're going and, and find ways to innovate within them uh, for yourself. Um, and, and here's a perfect example. So as Lauren said, the old fashioned, um, the Sankapa signature old fashioned is actually one that uses uh, chocolate and Angostura bitters, uh, Demerara, and grapefruit twist. And Lorena worked on that recipe with uh, Julio Cabrera, which is, is one of our yay icons. He's phenomenal. Um, but that cocktail, it has so many, it's infinite amount of old fashions you can make. So here, uh, Lauren really took a, a product that comes from Guatemala, again, bringing it back, coffee. Zacapa has, uh, Guatemala has beautiful coffee that comes from there. We're taking that and infusing that into the Demerara, so now you're popping again some of those coffee notes. Oh, and, this, this and the chocolate bitters. Yeah. Old not being no, we're not serving the old fashioned because we're gonna give you the recipe so you can do it at home. <laughs> and play around with things that you like to do. Um, you know, this, this has those beautiful aromas. I've done um, old fashions uh, with Zacapa that have done uh, dark chocolate with maybe some almond extract in my Demerara to bring kind of that coconut and almond note. So this is a template that you can play with. And this, uh, when you play around with this at home, find a really beautiful coffee and uh, try this nice combination. But again, the grapefruit twist here echoes that concept that uh, Lorena says that the grapefruit zest on Zacapa is actually one of the most beautiful pairings, um, and she prefers it. You can always use orange as well, but try grapefruit, which is not used in many old fashions, and you'll see the spirit really pop, and it'll really highlight what's beautiful about um, Zacapa. A big round of applause, please, for Lynette and Jack. Thank you so much.